When is it okay to splurge in a big purchase? So I have watches. I have, I have a bunch of luxury watches at home. I have four. I have a Rolex Submariner, which is an amazing watch. It's, it, it is my favorite watch. I have a Tag Heuer. I have an Omega Speedmaster. And I have a Hublot. Four watches. And I bought these over the last eight years. Started buying watches in 2014. And I actually, I remember the, the first watch that I bought. Um, it was at the Venetian in Las Vegas. And I got a pretty good deal on it. And I said, wow, this is, you know, I mean, I was 40 years old at the time. And I said, well, you know, I waited until I was 40 to buy a luxury watch. So, yeah, I think this is appropriate. Now, about three years ago, I found another watch that I liked. It was another Hublot. And what it is, is it's a Spirit of Big Bang. And it's white ceramic. And it's a badass watch. It's an amazing watch. Now, I've had the ability to buy this thing in any time over the last three years. And I said to myself, no, I'm not going to do it. I'm going to wait until I come across some money. Um, it, it's just, and, you know, I have a lot of financial obligations. You know, one thing is, is that about three years ago, I started donating lots of money. And I, I'm on these scheduled donations. And I said, well, this is more important than buying a watch, you know, but donating money is more important than buying a watch. So, you know, this has been three years and I haven't done it. And I get to this year and the first couple of months of the year, I absolutely killed it trading and business is good. And, it, you know, it just seemed like the right time. So I'm going to Las Vegas tomorrow and there's a Hublot store in Caesars. And I said, well, maybe I'll call the store and see if they have the watch. So I called the store and they said, well, we don't have it at the store. And also, we don't have that watch in any store in the U.S. So if you want it, you're going to have to order it from Switzerland. But here you go. Here's a credit card form online and you can pay for the watch and you'll get it in six to eight weeks. So that's what I did. I bought the watch and I'm pretty excited about it. Because like I said, it's a badass watch. It's a it's a very cool watch. I'm pretty fired up about it, and it is a lot of money. It's more than I've spent on a watch ever. But this is how I handle extravagant purchases. You want to make 10 times more than the purchase. So let's say you're going to take a $3,000 vacation. What I would recommend is saving $30,000 first and then taking the $3,000 vacation. And what is the purpose of this? Well, the purpose of this is you set a financial goal and then you realize it. But in the process of realizing it, you realize another financial goal, which is saving for retirement. OK, a lot of people would say, well, the three thousand dollar vacation, I'm going to save up three thousand dollars and that's it. But and maybe thirty thousand is a little excessive, but even fifteen thousand, if you save five times as much, you realize two financial goals at the same time. And I highly recommend doing this. So, you know, look like I have enough money. If I wanted to buy 14 watches and clothes and cars and go totally nuts, I could do it. Uh, but I am constantly setting goals for myself. And I want to talk about this idea of setting financial goals. You know, I mean, it's very important. It really is. If there's something that you want, let's say a house. Let's say you want to buy a house. How do you get to that goal? You need to save up a hundred thousand dollar down payment. How do you get there? You have to make a plan. You have to make a plan and you don't do these things until you have saved enough because if you do it before, then you're going to go into debt and it's going to be it's going to be a disaster. So the other thing is, is that I'm building a house and I can't go around spending a ton of money, but I think waiting four years to buy a watch is not so bad. And we have this idea of delayed gratification. And there is such a thing as too much delayed gratification. There are some people out there that will delay gratification forever. And they'll get the delay, but they'll never get the gratification. They have the opposite problem of most people. You know, we in, in personal finance, we spend a lot of time focusing on the people who have spending problems. And we say these are the bad people. 
the people who have spending problems are the bad people. But there's people who have the entire opposite problem. They also have a spending problem. It's as they don't spend enough. That that is very common. In fact, I think it's more common than the people who spend too much. So, yeah, you have a lot of people that have these financial goals and they just put them off forever and they, they never do it. You know, and that's kind of what I was doing with this watch. I said, look, I've been waiting for four years. I mean, like, you know, one of these days they're going to take the watch off the website. It's going to be gone. They'll just phase out that model, you know, and then what am I going to feel like then? You know, you have people who have $15 million in their savings account and they live in a crappy house and they drive a crappy car just because. So I am on a mission. I am on a mission, but I'm on the opposite mission as Dave Ramsey. I am on a mission to get people who can spend money to spend money because we have a problem in this country. He thinks it is because people spend too much. And yes, that is true about a large number of people. But also you have an equally large number of people who spend too little and it causes problems different problems than the people who spend too much. The people who spend too much, they go into debt and it trashes their credit rating or they go bankrupt. I mean, these are very visible problems, but the people who spend too little also have problems, but they're not as visible and generally they have relationship problems or they're just existentially unhappy because they're not realizing their potential. So the goal here is to have a healthy relationship with money. And if you can't have a healthy relationship with money, you're you can't have a healthy relationship with money if you never spend any money, if you don't allow yourself the occasional luxury in a program that tells you that you must deny yourself all luxuries is never going to work. And people do this. You know, people do this for 40 years. They will, for for their entire adult lives, they will deny themselves luxuries to get to the end and they have a comfortable retirement. But uh, for 40 years, they, I guess, were unhappy, you know? So it doesn't sound like a great program to me. You know my answer to this. Just keep working and finding ways to make money. Stop slicing the pie into smaller and smaller pieces and figure out ways to make the pie bigger. And look, and I will concede, this advice does not apply to people who have spending problems. And if and if you're listening to this and, you know, if your credit score is below 680 or 650 and uh, you have you're paying a ton of interest on credit cards and et cetera, et cetera, this advice does not apply to you. This advice applies to the people They have their house paid off. They have their car paid off. They have lots of money in the bank. They are in an incredibly secure financial position and they're not spending money. Okay. You can always make more money. You cannot make more time. And time is a resource that is more scarce than money. And that's one thing you'll find when you, if you have conversations with rich people, they don't really care about money. They care about time. Okay. You can't make more time. So look, if you can find a way to make more time, I am all ears. And then we can talk about delaying gratification longer. So let me tell you a story. I'm in the process of writing a book. I'm writing a book proposal. That's what you do with nonfiction books. You write a book proposal. And uh, then once the proposal's done, you shop it around the publishers and then you get a book deal and then you write the book. OK, so I've, I've uh, I wrote this proposal back in October and I gave it to my literary agent and we've been going back and forth in this proposal, cleaning it up. And this has been five months and we're, we're getting we're getting close to a point in time where I'm like, you know, OK, it's you know enough, enough bullshit. Like we let's put, put an end to this process and go shop the book, you know, because I think six months to do a proposal is more than enough time. And from my standpoint, look, I'm 48 years old. I'm going to fucking die. Like I'm, (laughs) I, you know, I'm past halfway done with my life. I am past halfway done. And this proposal has taken up 0.6% of my life, right? So I am 0.6% closer to death. And, you know, I'm not mad about it, but, 
stuff takes time. But, you know, my agent, I think he's I think he's 34 or 35 and I'm 48. And I, you know, I experience my own mortality on a daily basis. So, yeah, yeah, I, I'm going to die someday. Hopefully not soon because there's more stuff I want to accomplish in this life. But I talk to my wife about this all the time. My wife has great genes. Everyone in her family lives to way over 100. Her grandfather is turning 100 in June. And the guy, he actually, he's in such good shape, he might end up being the oldest man in the world. He might live to like 120 or something like that. It's insane. I don't have those genes. You know, I'm probably going to live to 75, maybe 80, you know. So she could, uh, she could get married again and have another husband in 30 years. So I, I, I have nothing against that. She'll probably need some company. Aside from the cats. My By the way, my cat, so I have six cats. The oldest is nine, almost nine. The youngest is one, a little over one. That cat will pass away when I am 64 years old. Okay. Which means that I get to have one more round of cats after this. And that's it. It's all the cats I get to have in my life. You know, I just think of things in terms of cat lifespans. So if your house is paid for and your car is paid for and your retirement accounts are fully funded and you have no debt, why aren't you spending money? Why not? What is stopping you? You can get a new car. You can get a boat. You can learn to paint. That's not that expensive. If you're dreaming of something, why don't you do it? If you are in a position like that, your house is paid for, your car is paid for, everything's paid for, you have money in the bank, you have retirement accounts, what what are you waiting for? Okay. Now, I will qualify this by saying that a lot of people that have fancy cars and fancy boats, they're not paid for, and these people are not debt-free. You know, and that's one thing that we do. We we walk around and we go into somebody's house and we're like, holy shit, this is a really nice place. And you start doing this mental mathematics, you know, like how much money do they make? How do they pay for this place? Whatever. And the math doesn't add up. And the reason the math doesn't add up is because they're massively in debt, you know, and that that's a lot of people. OK, but if if you are in a position where you can spend money, spend the money. So. I'm not going to live my life like that. I used to live my life like that. I am a reformed cheap fuck. Okay. Uh, Like I said, I was the guy eating cans of beans on the trading floor at Lehman Brothers. 49 cent can of beans. I think the beans have gone up with inflation, but back then they were 49 cents. I would eat a 49 cent lunch at Lehman Brothers. I used to go to clubs. This was like 2008, 2009. And I would go and I would wear like a black fleece, like a broker fleece that I got as a Christmas present from a broker and a pair of like painter's jeans with like the little loop on the side. And I'm in and I don't I don't know why they let me in. (laughs) Like I look terrible, you know. I used to be the alligator arms guy when we went out for drinks. I never paid for drinks. I'm just not going to do that anymore. I make enough money. I'm going to enjoy it. And if I want to buy an expensive watch, I will buy an expensive watch. Besides, there are people who have much bigger watch collections than me. Uh, this will be watch number five for me. And I know people who have 15 to 20 and they're trading them all the time. I'm not really a collector. I wear these things. You know, the watch I'm wearing right now, th- this is it right here. It's, uh, it- it's, it's a Hublot. And uh, I've been wearing it every day for the last four years. And I beat the shit out of it. And I love the watch. And it's my favorite watch. And... That's that's what it's for. That's what money is for. So just a quick note, the Rolex Submariner, you can call the watch the Submariner. But if you've ever known somebody who was in the Navy who served in a submarine, they are not a Submariner. They are a Submariner. It's a crucial difference. And they'll get offended. If you call them a Submariner, they'll get all they'll get all pissy about it because a Submariner is somebody who is beneath a Mariner. Okay, but a submariner is somebody who is on a submarine, right? So anyway, like I said, I'm off to Vegas tomorrow, so don't burn down the place while I'm gone. 
And if you have your house and your car and everything paid off and your retirement accounts funded and lots of cash in the bank, go buy something nice for yourself. I highly recommend it. Thanks for listening to the Be Smart Podcast. I'm Jared Dillian. See you next time.